People who study positive psychology tend to report that they found that most people have a pretty constant, what they call, happiness quotient throughout life. In other words, regardless of how wonderful or how horrible the events may be in your life, how sudden the changes or radical the changes, people tend to find a certain balance, a certain level of happiness that they feel comfortable with, and they don't change much from that. The strong changes in life may get them down for a while, get them up. But like a scale that's been out of balance for a bit, it tends to go back and find its old balance. This reflects one of the Buddha's teachings, was that the things that make us really happy and miserable in life are not so much the events outside. They can have a huge impact on us in one way or another, in some cases, in extreme cases. But that's because those events get into us really change the way we perceive things, change the way we think about things, feel about things, breathe around things, actually. But for most people, they pretty much stay with their same perceptions and their same ideas, and even the same way they breathe. It stays pretty much constant. So after a radical change, they tend to go back to the level they were at before, which, if there were nothing you could do about that, would be pretty miserable. You're have a low happiness quotient for a good part of your life, that would mean you tend to expect to have it for the rest of your life. Fortunately, these things can be changed. And it's not by looking for events outside. You want to turn around and see, what am I doing to shape my experience? That I tend to have this low level of happiness. Or after an event that's been a, an especially bad event to go through, how do you get more quickly back up to a more tolerable level of happiness? Again, it's the questions you ask yourself, the things you pay attention to, what your intentions are around things, and the way you perceive things, and the kind of feeling tone you tend to carry around in the body and the mind. The Buddha has a technical term for this these aspects of what we're doing in the present moment. He calls it name. In other words, these are the things that the mind does in preparation for shaping your experience. One of the reasons why we meditate is to give you some new skills in this area. Your intention now is to stay with the breath, to stay with one thing continually. And you can add to that the intention you want to make this as pleasant an experience as possible. So that means you're going to be focusing on the feeling that you're trying to create here. And then you go to a perception of the breath, that your image, your mental image, it can be either a picture, picture in the mind or just a word or whatever, for how you conceive the breath and how you hold the concept of breath in mind. You hold on to that. both to the sensation of the breathing itself and to the perception. And then you ask questions about it. This is what attention is about. When the Buddha teaches attention, he doesn't teach bare attention. He teaches appropriate attention, which means that you learn how to ask the right questions. For the sake of the meditation, it's where are you focused? How is the focus going? Could it be stronger? Is it too strong? How's the breath? Is it a good place to stay? What adjustments would be useful to get it to be nicer? What's the feeling tone you're getting out of this? And how about your perceptions? Are they actually helping get the breath settled down, or are they getting in the way? Can you change them? There's a fair amount of thinking that goes into this. You've got to strategize to get the mind down. And after a certain amount of strategy, and when it works, again, you can let up a little bit. You don't let up on the strength of your focus, but you let up on the thinking. You give the mind a chance to really settle in and rest. And one of the purposes of all this is that you, so you can begin to see these processes in action. 
get a sense of what the Buddha is talking about when he says perception or attention. And then you want to learn how to turn that on other things as well, other aspects of your life. One obvious target, of course, is disruptive thoughts that come up in the meditation. You can ask yourself, what's the feeling tone around that? You can move into the physical side, too. Well, how are you breathing around it? It's disrupting things. Usually there's going to be an uncomfortable breath to go with it. Or sometimes there's a very pleasant breath to go with it when you're thinking about things that you really like. Well, an appropriate question there would be, okay, if it feels that nice to think about that, can I breathe that way as I focus back in on the breath? Can I maintain that nice feeling in the body? So I don't have to associate that pleasant feeling only with that thought. I can have the pleasant feeling with the breath. I'd be more inclined to stay here, which is a much more useful place to stay. If there is a disturbance and there's a tension that goes around that thought, you can ask yourself, how can I breathe around that so that it doesn't take hold in the body, that it doesn't hijack the body? And then if the thought has a particular appeal, you can ask yourself, well, what's the perception you hold around it? What do you think you're getting out of thinking this thought? What's the gain? And if it's a thought that you keep coming back to, there will be a perception of gain someplace, that you're getting something out of this. You've got to learn how to question that perception. You ask yourself, what's the intention around the thought? What are you hoping to get out of this? A lot of times it's just entertainment in the present moment. Sometimes there's no real intention at all. It just kind of wanders off. But there may be an intention hidden in there. So you ask these questions, probe around a little bit. Then as you get more and more used to these building blocks of how you put things together in the present moment, you can start taking unskillful things apart, unskillful thoughts, unskillful emotions. Just take them apart. You don't have to squash them. A lot of people get into trouble because they have a thought that comes up that they don't really like and they try to squash it. And it just creates all sorts of problems in terms of the breath, in terms of how things get sorted out in your mind. Because there'll be times when those thoughts come in and try to squash you. So you want to learn how to step back from the bit and say, okay, what is it that's going into this thought? What's the appeal? What's the perception? What's the way you're breathing around it? Can you take that apart? Can you look at the intention? You can look at the perception and say, these are things I don't really want. Do I really believe these things? No. What would you believe? Carry on a conversation like that and you can find yourself pulling yourself out of those thoughts, out of that way of perceiving things. Then you can reconstruct some more skillful thoughts and also some more useful feelings. In other words, you learn how to get in touch with the feeling tone around your thoughts. And you can begin to realize that many times it's pretty arbitrary. Some thoughts have certain associations with them, and then as soon as those associations come, you start breathing in one way. Other thoughts, other associations, you breathe in another way. Look at the thoughts that are actually getting you to breathe in a way that's really comfortable. You say, well, this is actually where the pleasure in that thought lies. It doesn't lie in the content of the thought so much as it lies in the sense of the energy in the body. It feels good around it. Let's see if we can remove the thought and keep the good energy. This is another reason why you don't want to just go squashing everything, because sometimes some thoughts are able to get you in touch with comfortable breath energies that you couldn't get in touch with otherwise. So you get into a comfortable breath, kind of through the back door. What this means is that, given the general feeling tone of your life, you don't have to stay stuck at that particular feeling tone. If you find that your general default mode is pretty low, Ask yourself, what kind of feelings are you creating in the present moment by the way you breathe? We tend to think of the present moment as a given. It's just the way things are. 
but it's not. You're already breathing around it. You're already doing other things to it. You're bringing a feeling tone to things, so we're not bringing a better one. If part of the mind says, well, this is artificial, well, you think that your other thoughts are not artificial, your other feelings are not artificial, just because they happen to be there right now doesn't mean they weren't created by your past intentions. They were. They're all fabricated. So as long as these things are put together, put them together well. When you're going through a bad period of life, it's the same sort of thing. You don't have to add any extra suffering on top of it by breathing in a way that's weighing you down, or perceiving the issue in a way that's weighing you down. So look at your perceptions, look at your attention, i.e. what questions are you attending to. If they're kind of the complaining questions, why is this happening? Why do they have to be that way? That's not helpful. Helpful. Focus on questions that actually would be helpful to i.e., what am I doing right now that's adding unnecessary stress and suffering to the situation? What can I do to drop some of that? So these four elements, feeling, perception, intention, attention, are things you want to get a good sense of as you meditate and then learn how to use them well as you go through life. So you can shape your interaction with yourself and your interaction with the world in a way that's as light as possible. And adds only the smallest minimum of unnecessary stress. And that will get you well started on the path.